go. Every breath I breathe, author of all eternity, giver of every perfect thing, to you be the glory. Maker of heaven and of earth, no one can comprehend your word. King over all the universe, to you be the glory. I am alive because I'm alive in you. And it's all because of Jesus I'm alive. And it's all because the blood of Jesus Christ that covers me and makes this dead man's life. So because of Jesus, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. Giver of every breath I breathe, author of all eternity, giver of every perfect thing, to you be the glory. Maker of heaven and of earth, no one can comprehend your worth. King over all the universe, to you be the glory. And I am alive because I'm alive in you. And it's all because of Jesus I'm alive. It's all because the blood of Jesus Christ that covers me and raised this dead man's life. It's all because of Jesus. Every sunrise sings your praise. The universe cries out your praise. I'm singing freedom all my days. Now that I'm alive, and it's all because of Jesus I'm alive. It's all because the blood of Jesus Christ. Sing that again. It's all because of Jesus I'm alive. It's all because of the blood of Jesus Christ that covers me and raised this dead man's life. It's all because of Jesus I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive. alive because of him and he is our living hope he made a way where there was no way how great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation 
I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory bear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken i am forgiven the king of kings calls me his own beautiful savior i'm yours forever jesus christ my living hope Let's sing hallelujah together now. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free, hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Let's sing that again. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me jesus yours is the victory hallelujah oh hallelujah Praise the one who set me free, hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free, hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. God, you are my living hope. You are good. You are good all the time. Always you are good in every circumstance. And you are our living hope. God, we do not hope in social interaction. We do not hope in government. We do not hope, God, in our own abilities um, or our own immune systems. God, we hope in you. You are our hope. Hmm. Amen. I think John's got a few announcements for us this morning. Morning, church. How are we doing out there today? It's a beautiful, sunny day. God is good today, isn't he? 
It's good to see you all today. I say that to my students. It's good to see you. See you on Sunday. We're seeing each other just in a different kind of way. So it's great to have you along this morning. We've got reason to celebrate this morning. We're going to celebrate with, with Mary Olson today. She is a grandma again. <laughs> I know Mary's laughing right now. Congratulations to her son David and his wife Jenny on the birth of little Joshua this week. And with all times, it's reason to celebrate and reason to mourn. We mourn with the family of Barb Goodman at her passing. And we, we, we mourn along with our high school students at the loss of one of their classmates this week, Lily Zimdars. Um, so we celebrate and we mourn, and God is good through it all. Uh, one announcement for the church family, a congregational meeting is coming up May 17th at 6 p.m. last week. Uh, Doc Anschutz kind of ex described how that's going to work. We're going to do our live stream of that, so you can tune into that meeting just like you tune into our service this morning. We're going to do elections and deacon, uh, election of elders and deacons that night, and so it's an important time to tune in into the life of the church. As we were having our production meeting this morning, we were we all commenting on how we miss meet and greet. And uh, so we, we had some creative ideas that you can meet and greet the people in your living room there by giving them a hug, because you can do that now. Or uh, may, maybe on chat you want to meet and greet while we, we get started with this next song, and you can, you can encourage one another. We miss you guys. Uh, I know you guys long to get together, and, and we long to see you again soon. So we're going to trust God in that, and we're going to worship in spite of the circumstance. So it's good to have you with us today. sing together with grace. Season of my life 
are enough in times of need. You are enough in times of fear and in times of comfort. You are the God of all comfort. Mm. And you have given us so much. Here we go. You have given me freedom. You have given me joy. You have taken my burden. Take my burden. You have, you have given me freedom. You have given me joy. You have taken my burden. You have given me freedom. You have given me joy. You have taken my burden. ask you something, and I want you to ask yourself this question. Is there anything in any area in your life where God is not enough for you, um, where you're not trusting him? How do, how do we know where those areas are? How can, how can we identify them? Well, over the last month, six weeks, um, has there been anything that has just rocked you to the core emotionally? Maybe more than you would think that would be uh, appropriate for this thing. Is there something that where we're just sort of si- sideswiped you? It sneaked in right under your skin. You thought you were trusting God in that area, and all of a sudden you begin to realize, I don't know if I'm trusting God in this area. I don't know if he's enough for me right here and right now. As we sing this next one, I want you guys to think about that. Um, is, there, is there an area where you need, to, you need to yield that to God again and again and again? Um, let's acknowledge that he is enough. Let's acknowledge as we sing this next song that he is stronger than any fear. He is stronger than any virus and that he is, uh, he is more than able to give us more than we could ask or imagine. Um, he is more than able to do his will um, to bring us uh, into, into his peace. He's able to do that. No 
beginning and no end. You're my hope and my defense. You came to seek and save the lost. You paid it all upon the cross. You are stronger. You are stronger. Sin is broken. You have saved. Christ is risen, Jesus, you are Lord of all. Let's sing, so let your name be lifted higher. We want you to be over all. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher. Be lifted higher in our lives. Let your name be lifted higher. Be lifted higher. Be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher. Be lifted higher. Be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher. Be lifted higher. Be lifted higher. Stronger, you are stronger. Sin is broken. You have saved me. It is written. Christ is risen. Jesus, you are Lord of all. You are stronger. You are stronger. Sin is broken. You have saved me. It is written. Christ is risen. God, you are enough. You are stronger than any opposition that we may come up against. God, um, no weapon forged against us can stand. Father, and, and we just trust you this morning. We put ourselves again at your mercy and say that, God, we're, we're helpless without the work of your Holy Spirit. We cannot save ourselves. Christ alone, Jesus, you did the work on the cross. It is finished. It is done. There's nothing we can add to it or take away. God, and the gospel is, is useful. It, it's applicable today, right now, in our lives. It's not just something we did a long time ago, a prayer we did a long time ago. The gospel is active and useful in our lives right now, God. And so we pray for that, that you'd, you'd prepare us and convict us. Continue teaching us the depths of your grace, even as we begin to understand the depths of our sin. Father, would you show us hmm, what you have for us, God? Open our eyes. Open our ears. In your name, amen. Let's continue in prayer. God, we thank you that you are stronger than our sin and you are stronger than our sorrow. You are strong enough to see us through good days and bad. And so, Lord, we are thankful that you have conquered sin. And with that, you have conquered the wages of sin, which is death. Lord, we come to you in gratitude this morning. We come to you in joy this morning. But Lord, we also want to lift up families that are hurting to you this morning. I pray for the Goodman family at the loss of Barb. Comfort them and encourage them. Bring them peace. And Lord, I pray for the family and the friends of Lily. Sometimes life is so hard. But Lord, we know that you are enough. And so we lift this family and these students to you and ask that you would reveal yourself to them, that you would comfort them, and you would use all things to bring glory to yourself. And so work something good, please. Encourage 
encourage the people that knew Lily. Lord, we rejoice with Mary at the birth of little Joshua. We thank you for new life. God, you're good, and you're the giver of all good things. And so we come to you this morning in celebration because you have called us to be your children, and we thank you so much for that. But we pray for the world that we live in as, as things prolong here with our, our isolation and our, our shutdowns. Uh, we, we start to see things starting to bubble up and boil over in, in, in communities and states around us. And, and Lord, as, as our world becomes more unsettled, Lord, I pray for us as your church, Lord, that we would be light in that dark place. I pray for us that we would use this time of great uncertainty to point people to you. In this world, we will have trouble, you've promised us. But take heart, you've said, I have overcome the world. We can have peace in the midst of the chaos. We can have peace in the midst of death. We can have peace in the midst of isolation. And Lord, may we be peacemakers. Help us to make a difference. And so I want to pray for our leaders of our, our state and our country that you would give them wisdom and that they would um, open things up as needed when the time is right. And, and Lord, I pray for the hearts of the people. Lord, may we not become enemies. May we be peacemakers. So Lord, we lift our country and our current situation to you and we trust in your sovereignty and we know that even in bad things you work for good. So work, please, and use us as your instruments. Lord, I pray for our congregational meeting on the 17th. I pray for the election of our elders and deacons and the leaders of our church for the next year. Lord, help us to seek you out, to sense your will, and Lord, we pray your will be done here in the Life of Faith Community Church. We thank you for our family. We thank you for the body of believers that you have put together here in this place as your bride. May we be ready for you. Lord, we love you. What a privilege we have to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll be reading from Matthew 19 this morning, verses 1 through 12. So if you have your Bibles, Matthew 19. Starting in verse 1, when Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went to the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to test him, and they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, he replied, that the beginning of creation the creator made them male and female and he said for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh so they're no longer two but one therefore what God has joined let man not separate why then they asked did Moses command a man to give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away Jesus replied Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, and marries another woman, commits adultery. The disciples said to him, If this is the situation between a husband and wife, it's better not to marry. Jesus replied, Not everyone can accept this word but only those to whom it has been given. For some are eunuchs because they were born that way, others were made that way by men, and others have renounced marriage because of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. Well, hey, good morning, everybody, from Pastor Rusty. I'm glad to be with you again in the way that we can around here. Uh, I don't know how you feel today, but one thing that made me feel a whole lot better was just getting up in the morning, and man, we had a beautiful, sunshiny day. Uh, I took the T-tops off my car yesterday, 
and I drove into church with the T-tops off. So if my hair looks a little muffed, that's the reason for that. No, seriously, I'm so grateful for these warmer days that we're getting. And I went out yesterday and, and tried to do a little golfing, believe it or not. And I'm not a very good golfer, and uh, I was able to prove why I'm not a very good golfer when I went yesterday with Pastor Don and with Rick Anschutz. And, boy, they were just shooting that ball so well, and I was muffing it about five yards down the fairway. And uh, lots to laugh at with your pastor, let me tell you, let me tell you. Anyway, I'm glad you're here today. Uh, in this series of messages that I am presenting on marriage and on family that we've entitled Home Improvement, uh, this morning I want to address a rather sensitive subject that in some churches it doesn't get a lot of attention. And sometimes pastors don't want to talk about it all that much. Quite frankly, as your pastor, I'd rather not talk about it, but I'm going to. I want to talk about the subject of divorce. In keeping with the metaphor we've had of home improvement, I'm going to entitle uh, today's message, Divorce When the House Falls Down. Divorce When the House Falls Down. What happens when there is an unhappy marriage? Can a Christian couple choose to divorce if they're desperately unhappy with each other? Can Christians have a divorce if they have what they call irreconcilable differences? Uh, what happens if there's an abusive relationship? Uh, what if a husband is beating up on his wife or beating up on the children? Or there's sexual abuse in the home. Is that a cause for divorce? What happens if there is marital neglect? What if a husband or a wife has emotionally abandoned their spouse and they're just not there anymore? Is that a reason why a person can file for divorce? What happens in the case of immorality or marital unfaithfulness if a spouse has become entangled in an emotional affair? Is that a reason for a person to then, uh, is that a reason for them to divorce their spouse? And if there has been a divorce, whether it's a biblical divorce or an unlawfully biblical divorce, and some don't even know what I'm talking about there, we're going to be getting into that today, is a person then able to remarry? What about the subject of remarriage? Can a Christian who has been divorced for any reasons, whether with biblical grounds or unbiblical grounds, can they remarry? This is a very sensitive subject. It is a subject that is very complicated, and I think for that reason, many churches might just choose to not preach on it at all. I wonder sometimes if the kinds of responses among churches would be one of two. The first one I call heaping guilt and shame. And the message uh, is given in stern, angry tones, God hates divorce, so don't you dare do it. If you do it, if we don't kick you out of the church first, you're going to turn into a second-class citizen. And some people in churches, when they go through a divorce, they're thrown on the trash heap. And sometimes the church makes an example of them. It's just one way to deal with it. I don't think it's the right way. But then there is a second extreme on the other end of it, which I call looking the other way. And there is no counsel, uh, there is no seeking of Scripture, Nobody wants to say anything, right? Nobody wants to do anything. Nobody wants to look judgmental. And if a divorce does occur, well, then the pastor just kind of looks the other way, or the church looks the other way, and people who go through it are left bleeding and to die, and they can't heal from what has happened in their lives. It has occurred to me more than once, man... There's got to be a way that we can deal with the factuality of divorce. There's got to be a way that we can deal uh, with the reality of divorce. In the culture in which we live today, we have to deal with the prevalence of divorce and be able to affirm God's truth and God's grace all at the same time. And I don't know how I'm going to be able to cover all those things in one sermon, but I'm going to do the very best that I can with you. Again, using our metaphor of home construction, uh, sometimes a house starts to fall down. Sometimes a marriage starts to fall down. What can we do when a house, when a marriage is in danger of falling down? 
I don't want to spend the bulk of my time talking about this aspect of things today, but I think I need to say something about it. When the house is listing, or it's hanging on a precipice, and the D word has been voiced, come on now, let's be honest. Let's be honest. For those of us who have been married for more than two weeks, all of us have gone through an unhealthy time in our marriages. For any uh, number of us, there have been uh, those kinds of experiences where, we have, where we've had unresolved tension. And those tensions are sky high, and the conflict is high. And the marriage is explosive. Sometimes couples have stopped talking to each other. They're giving each other the silent treatment, because they're maybe in some ways talking past each other. And there is no being intimate in the marriage. It's been limited. There is the line of demarcation down the center of the bed. You know, don't you cross that line. No, don't you cross that line. And if we happen to be a Christian couple that goes to a Christian church, the last thing we want to do is tell anybody about it. We don't want to blow our cover and let people know that we're not having a healthy marriage at this time. And sometimes there's the lure of an emotional affair that's hanging in the background, or sometimes there's a full-blown sexual affair that is in the background. And listen, if perchance I'm talking about you, and I very well may be, if your marriage is listing and you're thinking about divorce, and you've spoken the D word around your house before in a trying moment, the most important thing I can do today is to give you hope. And I really do. I want to give you hope. When the marriage is falling down, so many couples are thinking to themselves, you know, nobody has it like we do. Nobody knows how bad it is. No one knows what I'm going through. Or we think it is so far gone. The marital house is so badly broken. There's nothing left to do. The marriage is hopeless. The only thing we can do is get a lawyer. And listen to me, those of us who know Jesus Christ and who know the power of His, of his, uh, of his person in our lives either know or we need to know that God and that Jesus Christ can transform the most difficult of all experiences. Jesus can transform the most desperate of any marital situation. And in the church, we have to always remember, uh, more than anything else, that we are a hospital. Our church is a hospital. It's not a trophy case where people and their marriages are put on display Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And I want you to know that no matter how far gone that you think your marriage may be or how bad things may be, it is not beyond the transforming power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to give you hope today. When a marriage is in trouble and couples are contemplating divorce, what we need to do, first of all, I think, is be able to reaffirm what the biblical, quali what the biblical qualifications for divorce actually are. And many people don't even know what I'm even talking about here. And I can't get into all the depth I'd like to get into this morning. But from a fundamental point of view, Jesus said it is allowed because of the hardness of men's hearts. It is something that happens because of the hardness of people's hearts. Sometimes when the house is starting to fall down and we're thinking about getting a divorce, all we want to do is just get out. We're sick and tired of being in that awful situation that we are in. And somebody has to have the moral courage to stand up and say to us in a valley time, that we're not allowed to leave it. That God doesn't let us leave it. And that's part of my role for some of you as your pastor. Under what circumstances can a believer seek divorce? What does the Bible say about that? I wish I could explain all this in greater detail and show you all the scriptures and give all the background too, but there are basically uh, three situations where a divorce can happen. Number one, adultery. And we read about that in the text that John read today, Matthew chapter 19. Secondly, emotional and physical neglect. And I read about that in a passage in the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 21, verse 10 and 11, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and lastly, abandonment or abuse. And that we also read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. But basically, friends, that's it. That's it. Those are the only three. And sometimes in a marriage, we are so frustrated with our spouse, amen? Sometimes we are so frustrated with our spouse 
that all we can think about is, I want out. I want out. I didn't sign up for this. But in those moments when the house is creaking or the house is listing, somebody needs to hold our feet to the fire and remind us for our own good. Somebody needs to remind us for our own good that God isn't going to let us leave. And we simply can't do that. This isn't going to be a really popular thing for me to say right now, but I'm going to say it, that in certain situations, when couples are at risk, we need to remind them that we said at the altar, what? To death do us part. To death do us part. And sometimes that means persevering through a dark, deep valley time where in your marriage one or both of you thinks it's never going to get any better. It's never going to get any better. My good friend and a very wise Christian counselor out in California, Ron McLean, wrote about some he calls the divorce assumption. This is called the divorce assumption. He says that most people will assume who are stuck in an unhappy marriage, they have one of two choices. Uh, number one, number one, stay married and just be absolutely miserable. Or secondly, you will be able to get a divorce and then start to be happy. But he points out in his research that many people are studying these days and they're finding out that those aren't the only two options that are out there. Linda Waite from the University of Chicago conducted some research that shows two-thirds of, unhappily, uh, two, two of unhappily married couples who stayed married reported that their marriages were happy five years later. Isn't that something? In addition, she said, the most unhappy marriages reported the most fantastic turnarounds. And among those who rated their marriages as being very unhappy, very unhappy, eight out of ten who avoided divorce were happily married five years later. You know what? I don't know anybody who's saying that these days. I don't know anybody who's preaching that these days. You don't hear that anywhere. And if you talk to your beer buddies about your marital woes, they say, well, you don't got to put up with that. Just go get yourself a lawyer and get yourself a nice divorce. Or some of your girlfriends might see the very same thing. And God tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11 and 19, that as believers, get this now, we have been reconciled to God. We have literally been reconciled to God. As a result of being reconciled to God, verse 18 says, we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. And so reconciliation is what has happened to us. It's what God has done with us. That's our identity. We are now reconciled people. And as a result of that, reconciliation is what we're all about. Reconciliation is what we do. And here in the church, I believe it's our job to be good at reconciliation and to be good at helping married couples who are in stress to be able to reconcile. That's what we do as a church. That's what we do in Christ. And when it happens, we have a very, very powerful testimony to share. When people have lost perspective and they think that divorce is the only option for the unhappiness they're experiencing, those of us who truly love them, who really care for them, need to remind them that the risks for divorce are great. They are great. And the unanticipated costs for divorce are extremely high. The small print that no one wants to even read about, it's there, and it's high, and the devastation of divorce is wide and deep. Couples who are in stress sometimes don't want to hear this. But the percentage of second marriages and third marriages and how they last are very poor. Over 60% of second marriages usually do not last. 80% for third marriages. And the damage that is done to children as a result is just extremely high, and it can be many times lifelong. And knowing the prevalence of emotional attachments, that decision to divorce when there's some other person waiting in the wings is the absolute worst time to be able to seek a divorce. And that's when so many people do it. I mean, these are just some of the things these are some of the things I would say to those of you whose marriage might be dangling on the precipice. 
You feel like your marriage isn't very strong right now? You've been thinking about wanting to have out? I hope you'll think about some of those things. And I have other things we could say as well. And I'm always willing to be able to be of counsel to you. But more importantly, let me talk about what we do when the house has already fallen down. Do you know what I'm saying? When the house has already fallen down. Whether we like it or not, the fact of the matter is that divorces have happened and divorces happen. There are people who have chosen divorce. There are people who have been divorced. They didn't want to be divorced, but it was imposed upon them by their ex-spouse. Sometimes there are biblical reasons for divorce. Some of the things I just talked about a couple minutes ago. And uh, sometimes there are unbiblical reasons for a divorce. The American Psychological Association says uh, in 2019 that about 40 to 50% of all marriages, first-time marriages, are ending in divorce. I think those have been the numbers for quite a long time in our culture. It hasn't changed much over the last decade or two. And I happen to think that is why so many young people these days choose to not marry and why they just live together. Because they've seen so many marriages blow up. They don't hardly know many marriages that have lasted. And so why get married? I want to tell you, you'll find them in a Bible-preaching, Christ-centered Christian church. And they really can be found. But if you've already been divorced, if that happened to you sometime in the past, and you know you've been in that way for a long time, what are you to do now? Maybe you've been divorced and remarried. How do we bring healing to you in your life if that has happened to you? What if the house has already fallen down? And the answers I want to give you this morning are not going to be easy. They're not going to be simple. A lot of the situations that we find ourselves in or people find themselves in can be messy. And the insights I want to share with you this morning are going to require courage and strength and grace all at the same time. But I believe that for those of us who are Christians in a, in a Bible-teaching, Bible-preaching church, we need to be able to see the Word of God for what it is, and we must provide wise biblical counsel. And the things I'm going to talk about today are going to be very controversial in the next 20 minutes. And some of you are going to probably differ with me to maybe some extent. But from the Scripture, from the Scripture, I want to be able to lead you and guide you uh, as your pastor as best I can. I want to be a good shepherd. I really do. As your pastor, I want to be a good shepherd. What do we say about when the house has already fallen down? Number one, from the Scripture, God does allow for divorce. Hmm. That may not be what some of you were wanting to hear from me, but that is nevertheless true. Some of you, I think, will be uncomfortable with what I just said, because if I say that it is true that God allows for divorce, well, then people are going to go out and do it, and we don't want people to do it, and so don't ever allow divorce. And with the best of intentions, sometimes Christians think that God doesn't allow for divorce at all, and I need to say that simply isn't true. That simply isn't true. In the passage that John read for us earlier today from Matthew chapter 19, uh, Jesus was asked about the lawfulness of divorce, and there was quite a bit of controversy going on in his day about that. Some of the Pharisees tried to suggest to Jesus that Moses commanded, that Moses commanded, if a man wanted to divorce his wife, all he had to do was write her a, a certificate of divorce. So that'll do it. Just do the paperwork and go on to the next step. But Jesus said, no, 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 no. My father never commanded divorce. Moses never commanded divorce. He said Moses permitted. You see that there? Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. Why? Because your hearts were hard. But it was not that way from the beginning. So what is the fundamental reason why so many people divorce these days? Answer, bottom line is, is because their hearts are hard. And our hearts get hard. If you're married today, I want to say to you from the pulpit, if you're still married, guard your heart. Guard your heart. 
It is not difficult to let your heart get hard. I'll admit it as your pastor. I've had a hard heart from time to time. I've had a hard heart about life and a hard heart about my wife and marriage from time to time. And the only reason that it got turned around was because of God's influence in my life. And God was able to change that. God softened my heart and He can do that for you. I want you to know that. So in the Scripture, I want you to realize that God does allow for divorce. But then the second thing I would say from Scripture is that God regulates divorce. Knowing it was not this way from the beginning, knowing that divorce many times has sin in it, and that people will have hard hearts, in the Bible, God regulates divorce. He doesn't want it happening for any and for every reason. Hmm. Again, comb through the Scripture, it's adultery, it's emotional and physical neglect, it is abandonment or abuse, and that's it. And so what I'm going to say next is going to be very painful for some of you to hear. I'm fairly confident that some of you are going to struggle with the things that I'm going to say next. But in the context of a Christian marriage, okay? In the context of a Christian marriage where you have a Christian church, if a couple or one in the marriage is leaving their spouse, apart from these three reasons, if a person is taking steps towards a divorce, apart from these reasons, those of us who truly love this person and know this person need to come alongside and say, No! God does not want you to do that. We don't want you to do that. We will do whatever we can. We will come alongside you. We will encourage you. But we're going we're, we're gonna to hold you to your marriage vows. And if a person who is uh, taking steps towards an unbiblical divorce is unwilling to change, eventually the church is called upon to do something that is called church discipline. And sometimes churches need to step up to the plate. You ever heard of this before? If someone is sinning in some way, in a spirit of love, let me say it again, in a spirit of love, those of us who love this person need to say, it can't be business as usual. It can't be fellowship as usual. We can't just keep going on as if nothing happened. And at times, as a church, we need to withdraw fellowship from a person who is sinning in this way. And I know that many churches don't do this anymore. Many churches won't do this anymore. They just look the other way. But I want to say, if we're going to be the kind of church here at Faith Community that really loves people, if we're going to be the kind of church that really cares about people the way that we say we do, we've got to have a tough love. And we've got to say to the one who was erring or thinking about erring, you can't be a part of this. You can't be a part of what you're doing and have fellowship with our church at the same time. Make sure that you don't misunderstand what I've just said and what I'm not saying. As believers, we are to never discipline the one who is being divorced, who doesn't want to be divorced. We're never to discipline the one who, who, uh, who is choosing to divorce because their spouse was unfaithful or because they were being abandoned. They had a spouse that was beating them senseless or beating the children senseless. Not that. We're to never shame or to humiliate uh, or, or treat as second-class citizens those who had a divorce imposed upon them. I want to tell you, some self-righteous Christians, some self-righteous churches get this all mixed up and that's exactly what they do. And that's not right. Uh, that is not right. That is wrong. You say, Pastor Rusty, this thing about church discipline... In your pastoral experience? I mean, have you ever done this? Have you ever led your church or some people through these steps of church discipline? And I want you to know that I have. For a period of time, we had to send a clear message to people that it's not business as usual, it's not fellowship as usual, and I'm so glad that we did it, even though it was the hardest thing for me to do as a pastor. But here is where my application and my understanding of a biblical teaching gets messy. And some of you are going to disagree with me over what I'm going to say next. And if you can, we can certainly talk about it later. I'm glad to talk to you at virtually any time. But hear me out, will you? Hear me out. If someone has chosen to divorce for unbiblical reasons, hear me now. 
they can still be forgiven by God. They can still be given a second chance. And they can be ministered to in the church. Some of you are going to say, now what? What did you say, Pastor Rusty? That doesn't sound biblical at all. You were just talking about church discipline, and now you're talking about these very same people coming back into the church. That's not right. But listen, the fact of the matter is this. When people have had a heart and heart have chosen divorce, when people have made sinful choices by choosing an unlawful divorce, they can still be forgiven by God for what they've done. God can completely pardon. God can completely erase the fact and the memory of sin. And people who have been divorced for unbiblical reasons can still be and should be ministered to in the local church. You say, Pastor Rusty, how so? How can you talk? How can you think like that? Listen, when God offers to pardon and to forgive and to give people second chances, there's something that God's looking for. What is that? I'm going to give you a key word. Repentance. Repentance. It doesn't matter what kind of sin that we're talking about. It doesn't matter what we've done. Not just about this issue of unlawful divorce. God is ready to pardon us for even the worst of sins. But if we want God to forgive us, what does He want from us first? He wants us to repent. He wants us to have repented. He wants us to admit that He was right and that we were wrong. I think of Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent then and turn to God that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Some of you are asking about the second coming of Christ. How come Jesus hasn't come back in the last, 10, 000, in the last, two, last 2,000 years? You know, why has it been so long? 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So why is God waiting? Why is Jesus waiting? He's given us time to repent of sin. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, Psalm chapter 51, uh, verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Now listen, here's where things get messy. Here's where things get messy. And I'll admit it, the Bible deals with messy situations, and God deals with messy people like your pastor. I want you to know God redeems messy situations, and God redeems messy people. And there is always hope for us, no, no matter where we've been. But if it was a Christian marriage, but there was an unwillingness to repent from an unbiblical divorce, a loving church is called upon to exercise church discipline, Right? Yes, that's right. And so for a while, it may be that a person is estranged from the church. Maybe they elect to go away, or a church withdraws fellowship from a believer for a period of time. You say, Pastor Rusty, how does this issue of then God's forgiveness work? How does a person who has since then been divorced and remarried, or has been divorced and remarried and then divorced again, or this has happened several times, how does this person find their way into the grace of God? And how do they find their way back into the church? Here's how it works. Here's how it works. I'm going to be very practical. First of all, the people of God, the people in the church, like God Himself, those who are disciples of Jesus Christ, like Jesus Himself, are characterized by grace. Our first response to everybody is God's grace. When people sin uh, in any way, no matter what it is, those of us who are believers can never be characterized by a self-righteousness or by law where we're throwing the book at people. We just can't do that. The whole time, the people of God, like God Himself, the people of God, like Jesus Christ Himself, are hoping and praying that this person will come back. We want them to come back to God. We want them to get their lives right. And we are wanting that to happen in the most unusual way. We're primed to see God work in a person's life and have them come on home. And so think this through with me. 
Sometimes a person divorces for all the wrong reasons. And they go away. Many times I find that does happen. I wish it didn't, but many times it does. Maybe for a long time. Or sometimes an individual divorces for all the wrong reasons and then they remarry. And that second marriage doesn't work. And now they're thinking, now what do I do? Can I come back to God? Can I come back to the church? Will the church accept me? Or sometimes a person divorces for all the wrong reasons and they remarry and maybe the second marriage lasts. Maybe it does. But in their heart of hearts, they know that what they did was wrong. And maybe they're sensing the genuine conviction about the sinfulness of what they did and how they treated their ex-spouse. And God's been speaking to their heart and they know it. If someone who has sinned against God and who has sinned against their ex-spouse and their children realizes what they did, and if that conviction is starting to get to their heart and they want to make things right, can they be forgiven by God? Can they be reconciled to God? Can they be reconciled to God's people? I want to say unequivocally, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. But again, there is something God's going to require at the outset. And I'm not always 100% sure that people are willing to do that. They need to confess to God. Not standing in front of the whole church. They need to confess to God that what they did was wrong. In the quietness of their heart, they need to repent about what they did. I think they need to have the moral courage to renounce what they did. But if they will, and I believe many times people will, if they will, just like the story Jesus told us in Luke chapter 15 of the prodigal son, we learn that the father was waiting for this person to come back, what? The whole time. Standing in the horizon. Just hoping that his son or his daughter would return. And I think that those of us in the Christian church should be just like the Father, don't you? We need to be just like the Father. Even if it's the sin of an unlawful divorce, Pastor Rusty, even that, yes, even the sin of an unlawful divorce. And this isn't true about just the sin of of an unlawful divorce. It's true about any sin. You name any, any sin that it is. No matter what you've done. God's going to deal with you with His mercy and His grace. Many of us know, at least in the church, that passage from Malachi chapter 2, verse 16, where God says, I hate divorce. Some of you know that passage all too well. Does God hate divorce? You bet that God hates divorce. You are sure He does. Why does God hate divorce? He knows the kind of damage that it does to people. He knows how much hurt that it causes. He knows the devastation of the shrapnel that wounds innocent people. He knows how it mars the institution that is going to represent Christ in the church. And he knows what it does to children. And he knows what it does to a whole society. Yes, unquestionably, God hates divorce. But can I tell you something? Hear me out on this. God hates all sin. God hates any sin and every sin, no matter what it is. And if at any point along the way we will genuinely repent of our sin and confess it for what it really was and we mean it, and we're not playing games, and we're not playing word games with God, listen to me, God will forgive us. Let me read it again. Let me read it again. Psalm 51, 17. The sacrifices of God are what? A broken Spirit, a broken spirit and a contrite heart, oh God, you will not despise. I have to ask the question though, have we had a a broken spirit? Has our spirit been broken? Has it ever been broken? Have we ever had a broken spirit? I think that's a fair question to ask. Sometimes in well-meaning Christian circles, sometimes in well-meaning Christian churches, we treat the sin of divorce or an unlawful divorce as if it's the unpardonable sin. And I have to have the courage to tell you that, quite frankly, as much as I hate divorce, it's not. It's not the unpardonable sin. And here is where the rubber meets the road. 
Here is where the application to even in our own church, here's where it gets messy. And some of you are going to have to think this through with me. There were some of you who divorced and you're single now. Maybe you had biblical grounds for that divorce. And if you did, you have not sinned. There's nothing wrong with what you did. But you may be among those who chose divorce when you did not have biblical grounds. And that was then, and this is now, and some time has elapsed, and you're thinking, can I come back to God? Can I come to Faith Community Church? Will they let me worship here? Can I be a part of this fellowship? There were some, maybe in our own fellowship, some of you who were divorced for reasons that were not biblical at the time, and you know that, at least you know it now, and now you're remarried, maybe even happily so, at least reasonably happily so. Although many people have realized if they were working as hard in the first marriage as they were working in the second marriage, the first marriage would have probably lasted. But that's over. That's over. That's done. We, we really can't deal with that anymore. You're walking on eggshells, some of you, as you're hearing what I'm saying. You want to know what Pastor Rusty's going to say. What does Pastor Rusty say here? What's he going to say about me? What's he going to say about us? Can God deal with us? Can we be accepted in his church? Can we... Can we come there? I can hear a pin drop. The sanctuary and your homes are hushed. I think some of you already know that in some churches, if you have been divorced unlawfully, you are excommunicated for life. You can never come back. You're out, period. It's over. My teaching, I believe based upon Scripture, is going to be humble. It's going to be gentle and it's going to be firm, I'm going to ask you, have you repented of sin? Have you repented of this before God? Did you confess it as sin before God? Maybe then you didn't. Maybe at the time you didn't even know it was sinful. Maybe at the time you just blamed it all on your ex. But now you're wiser. And you're seeing things from a different point of view. You're seeing the bigger picture. Do you want to know what? Whatever happened back then, happened. And you can't undo what was done. That water's gone under the bridge. But I know this from Scripture. And it's true about virtually any sin. Psalm chapter 103, verse 8 through 12. Man, I love this verse too. The Lord is compassionate and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in love. He will not always accuse nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. And this is what I know for a fact, that if we will genuinely authentically, meaningfully confess our sins before God, he removes them as far away as the east is from the west. The blood of Jesus Christ completely wipes out any stains of sin that were in our lives, no matter what it was. And I can hear it now. Somebody's going to object. You're teaching, Pastor Rusty, that all a person has to do is go ahead and choose an unlawful divorce, and just give it some time, and then the church is obligated to take them back, and God's obligated to overlook it. Eh. i got to tell you something, I don't think it's quite that simple. I don't think it's quite that simple. God knows our heart. God knows if we're playing games. You can fool the pastor, you can fool the elders, you can fool pastors, I maybe can't fool Chad, but... You can fool any of us, but you, but you can't fool God. He'll see right through it. But I believe, listen to me now, when we come to the end of our rope, and God's conviction has had its effect upon our lives, and our spirit has been broken, and our hearts have been changed, God will completely forgive us for whatever it is that we've done. Even the sin of an unlawful divorce. I'll bet 
You're not going to hear the kind of stuff that I talked about this morning much anywhere else. There's not many places you're going to go to where you can hear this, this kind of teaching. Maybe in, uh, in some churches they would never teach it. Like I said, either there is harsh judgment for your unlawful divorce or your divorce and you get thrown out of the church forever and because you did what you did, God is done with you and the church tars and feathers you and they make an example out of you and there's no way back. And for a lot of people, they wouldn't ever want to come back anyway to a church like that. Or... A church looks the other way and puts no warnings, no obstacles, no discipline in the plans to divorce because they misinterpret what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, judge not lest ye be judged. And so some people say, well, judge not lest ye be judged. And as your pastor, who is called upon to lead and to shepherd this church, I want to be among those who take a stand for God's institution of marriage. It is God's institution. It is His design. And indeed, God calls for permanence. God calls for permanence. As your pastor, I want to be among those who do not punish those who had divorce imposed upon them. I want to be gracious with you and remind you that God weeps with you and as your pastor, I will weep with you. I'm willing to weep with you. God doesn't punish you. I want to be among those who will stand up and say to those who are on the brink of choosing an unlawful divorce, don't do it. Don't do it. Please. Stop. Ask God to change you. Ask God to change your heart, your hardened heart. Yes, ask God to change the heart and heart of your spouse. But it probably needs to start with you. And that probably needs to happen. But I want to be among those who will hold your feet to the fire and make you feel uncomfortable in your thoughts of pursuing a divorce. You'll be glad I did this later. You'll be glad that I preached this later. And yet, for those who have strayed long enough and far enough from God who realize now the error of their ways, who can't make excuses anymore, who want to make things right, who want to come home, who know deep down that they've sinned against God, they've sinned against their spouse. Listen, I'm primed to lavish them with the grace and the hope of God. Like the father in the story of the prodigal son that Jesus told, I want to be prepared to throw a party for the erring sinner, of whatever kind of sin it would be, no matter what kind that it was. And if there happens to be a crotchety older brother or a crotchety old son sitting in the pew who says, now wait a minute, you can't do this. Don't you know what he did? Don't you know what she did? We can't kill the fattened calf for him or her. I'm going to say, yes, we can. Are you missing the point? The person wants to come home. The person wants to come home. Never forget the words of Jesus out of that same Luke chapter 15 context. In the same way, I tell you, there was more rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And I want to ask you and I in our church, will we be among those who will join the angels in rejoicing when a, when a, when a sinner comes home? Or will we have our arms crossed and our eyebrows for and say, no, I'm not going to be a part of that because they had an unlawful divorce or some other kind of a sin. Never forget this. Never forget this. In John 4, Jesus initiated a relationship with a woman who had been married not two times, not just three times, it was five times. He knew exactly who she was. He knew exactly what kind of person that she was. He knew exactly what she had done. And when Jesus told her that he knew, it struck a raw nerve. And she knew she was dealing with someone who was maybe the Son of God. But you'll notice in the story, take note, Jesus didn't run her off. Jesus didn't run her off. He didn't humiliate her or make an example of her or tell her because she'd been married five times 
now she's going to have to divorce the fifth husband and just stay single for the rest of her life. He just offered her living water. And it changed her life forever. It changed her life forever. Can we do that with people who have had divorces and unlawful divorces in the church today? Can we be like Jesus was? In John chapter 8, Jesus was teaching out in the streets. Many of you already know this story. And they brought before him a woman who had been caught in adultery. The Bible says she was caught in the very act. In other words, the self-righteous crowd had been scoping her out. They had her in her sights. They knew what she was doing. And they barged in and they took her out and they brought her before Jesus. And if they had their way with with her, she was going to get stoned. The self-righteous crowd had already picked up their stones. And like many a modern-day legalistic church, they were in the mood for a stoning. And periodically, in well-intended legalistic churches, people get in the mood for a stoning. And people who have either been divorced or had an unlawful divorce become the object of the stoning. What did Jesus say to the broken woman? Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go and sin no more. Can we offer that kind of hope to people who have divorced badly? Can we offer that kind of hope to people who have made regrettable moral choices? If you have divorced badly, if you've made some regrettable moral choices, will you accept the forgiveness that God has prepared to offer you. Heavenly Father, this pastor is a sinner. I failed you many times. I have needed your grace in every aspect of my life. And you didn't cast me out. And you kept me in fellowship. And you put me in leadership. And it's my privilege, even though it's hard, it's hard for me to offer truth and grace at the same time. But I thank you for what you do in the lives of sinful, erring people. I thank you that you don't give up on us. The opportunity is always there for us to come clean, to fess up, to tell you, God, that you were right the whole time, and you're righteous, and we were wrong, and we were unrighteous. I pray you would give that hope to so many people today. I pray you would strengthen the marriages that still exist. I pray that you would uh, do a powerful work in the, in the homes and in the families and in the marriages that are a part of this church and anyone else's home that happens to be checking in today. And I pray that we would have a gracious spirit towards those who have sinned and whatever kind that it was and that we'd be prepared to throw a party when they come home. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing Amazing Grace. to fear 
Hey, you know, as we close the service today, I want to say something that many people who come to this church already know by, by experience. We're a church that highlights the grace of God. Our church is all about the grace of God. People finding God's mercy and hope and restoration and reconciliation. We are not about judgment and throwing stones at people. We emphasize God's grace. Many times we've said it here in this church, if you come you'll hear more people say it than one, that we are just one beggar telling another beggar where you can find bread. And we here have found God's forgiveness in our lives, and it's absolutely wonderful. We want to give that to you. If you have never received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you can make that decision today by a simple turning of your heart away from sin and turning to Jesus Christ and asking Jesus to come in and pardon you, to forgive you and to make you his child, it'll happen. And it happens by faith. And what needs to occur has been done at the cross. Now all that is required on your part is to turn to Jesus and turn to him in faith and invite him to come into your life. Could you pray this prayer with me? Jesus, I am a sinner. I know that I've sinned many, many times. I want to turn from my ways. I want to turn from my past. I'm turning to you, asking you to just erase the fact of everything that I've ever done and everything I will ever do. Come into my life. Forgive me. Make me your son. Make me your daughter. I promise that I will live for you.
Did you pray that prayer? If you did and you meant it, then you have become a believer in Jesus Christ today. And we as a church want to come alongside you and help you grow and know what the next steps are for how you grow in this personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And as we're talking about families and marriages and divorces, if you need some help, if you want some counsel, if your home is listing, if it's dangling off that precipice, we're willing to come alongside of you to give you whatever you need to keep your marriage strong. And by the power of Jesus Christ, I know this from my own personal experience, Jesus will change your heart. Jesus will change you. And you'll be so glad that you stayed in. Give me a call if you need. I've got a cell phone, 209 602 9980. If you want to come talk to me, just call me on the phone. Uh, call me up on that phone and I'll find a place to meet you somewhere, somehow. If you need to receive some confidential Christian counsel, as a church, we offer this. And there's a way that you can get some wonderful, professional, confidential Christian counseling to help you in whatever it is that you're going through, no matter what the need would be. Listen, how we love you. We love you with the love of Jesus Christ. I pray that you've been ministered to and given truth, and God bless you. Yes, you are dismissed.